Okay, greeting in the name of Jesus. It's very glad uh, for the opportunity to share the word of God with all of us. Today, I'd like to share from uh, John 15, 1 to 8. I am the true vine, and my father is the vine dresser. Any branch in me that does not bear fruit, that stops bearing, he cuts away, trims off, takes away, and he cleanses and repeatedly prunes every branch that continues to bear fruit. To make it bear more and richer and more excellent fruit. You are cleansed and pruned already because of the word which I have given you, the teachings I have discussed with you. Dwell in me and I will dwell in you. Live in me and I will live in you. Just as no branch can bear fruit of itself without abiding in the vine, neither can you bear fruit unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever lives in me and I in him bears much abundant fruit. However, apart from me, cut off from vital union with me, you can do nothing. I've probably read these scriptures umpteen of times, and I'm sure you must have heard this so many times too. And this scripture is talking about our fruitfulness as a Christian. Have you ever been in a uh, position in your life where you feel like there got to be more to this to life than just this? Where you feel like everything seems to be going fine, but somehow you are feeling restless on the inside. Like your Christianity is just going through this period of stagnancy. Like you are just not satisfied at the way things are. And I've been a Christian for 22 years. And there were periods of time when I was going through those dry, dry seasons in my life. And I believe many of us have gone through that as well. And it was later on that I understood why I was feeling restless, why I was feeling stagnant inside. Because every man has a need to be fulfilled in life. And you are only fulfilled when you do what you are supposed to do in this life. You are fulfilled only when you are doing what you are created to do, what you are supposed to do in this life. And that is number one. Number two, you are only fulfilled when your relationship with God is right. Only those two things. And uh, as I read this verse one day, it jumped out like it, as it is as if it jumped out from the page and it talked to me directly. Because I was, I was restless, I was frustrated. How come after becoming Christian for so many years, I don't bear much fruit? You know, I started comparing myself with all the other Christians out there who are doing great things for the Lord, who are doing mighty things for the kingdom of God. And I look at myself, I look at my life. I was just going to church once a week, going to cell group once a week. And uh, I wasn't doing anything much apart from that. And I heard of, uh, you know, sermons where, you know, ask people to come to church, you know, and then uh, they will hear the gospel and probably they will be converted. They will become a Christian after that. But somehow when I read the book of Acts chapter 2, when I see the community of Christians living together in unity, loving one another, selling their goods and their possessions for the common good of everybody, and there is this sense of belonging where everybody loves everybody, there's this peace, there's this unity uh, among them, I feel like there is a disconnect between our church today and the potential of what we can become. I believe the same Holy Spirit that was working in the early church 2,000 years ago it's the same Holy Spirit that is still working today. Amen? Amen? And there was this restlessness inside me. God, what was missing? So I started fasting and I seriously seek God. And uh, this verse really, really, I mean, spoke to me. Nelson, unless you abide in me, you are not going to bear any fruit. And in verse 5, it was said very clearly, apart from me, you can do nothing. So there are many lessons that we can learn from this scripture, but I'd like to share with you three things. Number one is if we want to bear fruits in our life, we need to allow God to prune us. We need to allow God to prune us. Verse 2, it was said here, any branch in me that does not bear fruit, he cuts away. And he cleanses and repeatedly prunes every branch that continues to bear fruit to make it bear much more and richer and more excellent fruit. Have you ever gone through trials, challenges, 
problems after problems in our life, what is our normal reaction when we go through trials and problems like that? Normally we complain, we pray to God, God, why do you allow this happening to me? But when I understood this, I understood that this is God's way of pruning me. He allowed problems to happen to us so that we will become more fruitful. You see, in the agricultural, uh, in the agricultural science, if you want to make a plant, a vine, to bear more fruit, you need to cut off the unproductive branches or the leaves that are prone to disease and unproductive. You have to, you have to cut them off. Otherwise, they're going to fight for the same nutrients from the vine. So it is a natural process of the, in the agricultural world. So the same analogy is used here. In order for God to make our life fruitful, He has to deal with our old nature, our carnal nature, our unregenerated uh, mind, our old self, the part of us that is not like Christ. So when I understood that, wow, then I welcome problems. I don't see problems the same way ever again. And I believe that many of us here we all have problems of all sorts. If you think you know somebody and you think that person's life does not have problems, let me tell you, you do not know that person that well yet. Because everybody is going through a battle that you do not know of. All of my friends, every single one that I know of as a friend, as a good friend, are going through a very pre pretty serious battle in their lives. And uh, sometimes when we look at their battle and the problems that they are going through, and we look at the problems that we are going through in life, it seems as if what we are going through is nothing. Yeah? And I understand this, that God is actually using those problems to make us mature as a Christian. And I found out that there are three things that normally God uses to prune us. Number one is our life relationships. Our life relationships with people. Whether it's your friends, with your family, He always uses that. Number two is your career. Now, our career is never smooth. Sometimes it's our business, there will be a lot of problems happening. Number three is your marriage. Your spouse is the one person that you cannot lie to. If you want to know the weaknesses of a man, ask the wife. She knows all about it. She can tell you all day long about the weaknesses of a man. So God always uses these three things to prune us. So that is the first lesson. And I realized that, you know, as I have a different perspective about problems, my life is actually becoming more and more productive. As I don't reject problems, as I don't complain about problems, but as I see from God's perspective about what He wants to do through the problems, wow, then I begin to see God's wisdom through it. You see, Joseph will not become a prime minister. He would not be prepared to become a prime minister if he didn't go through 11 years of slavery and two years in prison his character will not be suitable to become a prime minister. So God had to allow him to go through all those problems first. So that is the first lesson. The second lesson that I learned is we need to abide in the vine. What does that mean? We need to draw near to God. Drawing near to God. In James 4 verse 8, it says, Come close to God and He will come close to you. Who is the first one who needs to take initiative in this verse? We are the one. It's not God is the one taking initiative. We should be the one who needs to draw near to God first and then you say, He will draw near to us. Yeah. But how much hunger do we have nowadays for the Word of God? John 1.1 1, 1 says that in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God and, God, and the Word was God. He's talking about Jesus Christ as the Word. How much time do we really spend with the Word just, you know, meditating on it, just studying it, and speaking about it when we gather with our Christian friends? Most of the time when we gather among Christians, we talk about things that do not matter at all. We talk about food, we talk about vacation, we talk about work. What is the difference between us and the people out there who do not know Christ? We know of discipleship as our mandate as a great commandment, I mean, great commission that God has given us. But yet, many of us, we only know it as a slogan. And I was not satisfied with that kind of Christianity. And one day, I read a book 
called Heavenly Man. Any of you have ever heard of that book? And it was the story of a brother called Brother Yun. And it really, really changed the way I think about Christianity. Because I understood for the first time, what happened in the book of Acts can still happen today. The same Holy Spirit that was at work in Jerusalem 2,000 years ago is still working today. Amen? But we are not seeing the power in the church today. Why is that so? Because the church is asleep. Our church today has fallen asleep. Sometimes persecution is not such a bad thing, you know. I used to think, oh God, I'm so thankful I was born in Indonesia, now I'm living in Malaysia, where Christianity is allowed to be practiced freely. I thought it was a blessing. I thought it was something good. Well, it's blessing in some sense, but it is actually a spiritual disadvantage for us to live in modern cities such as KL. Do you know that? Because in big cities such as these, materialism is rampant. And if we are not careful, it is so easy for us to be distracted by all the things in this world, by all the worries of the world, by all the anxieties in our daily life, by the things that people of the world are chasing after success, popularity, prestige. And I was born, I was brought up in a culture that esteemed things like that. It was, there was this unspoken rule and expectation that you are considered successful in life if you have a lot of great possessions, such as great house, good car, if you have good education, you have great career, you have many businesses, then people look at you, oh, this man has made it in life. And I was growing in life with this mentality that hoarding and accumulating properties and assets and wealth is a good thing. So giving generously was never in my vocabulary at all. But then it all changed when I understood the kingdom mindset. It all changed when I read this heavenly, heavenly man. It was said in this story, Brother Yun, when he just first converted, when he just became a Christian, he was so hungry for the word of God. He was so hungry for the word of God that he prayed and he prayed and he cried and he prayed for the word of God because in China, it was under communism time. Bible weren't allowed to be printed at that time. So there was no way that he could get a Bible for himself. And he prayed day after day and his mother thought, my son has gone crazy because he was praying so fervently. And then the mother, seeing the state of her son, he said to his son, uh, Son, why don't you go to this particular evangelist? I heard that he has just come out from prison and he was serving in prison for a very long time. He's been doing evangelism for 20 over years. And uh, he, was, he was thrown into prison as a result of evangelizing. And uh, Brother Yun went up to this evangelist in the hope of getting a Bible. But, you know, they were very suspicious of each other at that time because they never know who was the spy, right? And they hid their Bibles inside underground so that in case there is a raid, nobody can find the Bible. So he pleaded with this old evangelist to at least just show him a few pages of the Bible and he said, I will be, I'll be satisfied. But the evangelist said, if you are really, really serious about getting a Bible, Praying about it is not enough. Go back home and fast and cry every day for the Bible. The more you cry, the more tears that you shed in order to get the Bible, the faster you're going to get that Bible. So Brother Yin took his advice. He went back home. Instead of just kneeling and praying, now he added fasting and crying, weeping before the Lord. And he did that day after day. Each day, he only took a bowl of rice every night for the whole day. And he did that for a hundred days. No Bible. And uh, he was at a point where his mother and father thought he was going crazy. Right? And they saw he was like really persevering for the Bible, his hunger for the, for the Bible. And they, and they started to sympathize with him. Right? And then one night, Brother Yun got this dream. In his dream, he saw that he was going uphill and he was, he was, pulling, uh, he was pushing a wheelbarrow. You know, a wheelbarrow. And the wheelbarrow was empty. 
He was going uphill. He was having great difficulty in doing that. And then he saw in his dream, there were three men coming down from the hills. The middle man that was uh, also carrying a wheelbarrow was an old man. And next to him, there were two younger men. And inside the wheelbarrow, there was a stack of bread inside. So they were coming towards him and then they met. And the old man asked him, young man, are you hungry? And he said, yes, I'm very, very hungry. You see, I came from a very poor family. And we used up all the money that we have to cure my sick father. So I am very, very hungry. And the old man took up a bread and gave it to him and said, eat it immediately. And when Brother Yun took that bread and put it inside his mouth, that bread turned into a Bible, into the Word of God. And at that, he woke up. And he was so excited. Oh, this is the answer from God. God has answered my prayer. And he searched frantically all over his house for a Bible. But when he found there was no Bible inside, he started weeping uncontrollably. His mother and father thought he has gone crazy because of the Bible. And they started crying together with him as well. And then not long after that, they heard a knock on the door. And uh, somebody was calling out his name. Brother Yun, Brother Yun. And he was surprised. They went to the door and opened the door. They saw two men outside. And he could recognize the voice of that man. It was the same voice as those men in the dream. And he, when he looked out, he was surprised. It was exactly the same man that he saw in his dream. And then they gave him a packet, a red packet. And then they left immediately. They didn't even talk to him. When he opened the packet, it, uh, the package, it was a Bible on the inside. Oh, he was so ecstatic. He was so happy. He read it day and night, hours after hours, pouring into it. And when he, when he sleep, he even embraced it in his, in his sleep. And... Uh, Today, Brother Yin is a church leader of not 1,000, not 10,000, not hundreds of thousands, but hundreds of millions of Christians in China. And because of that, he has, not, he has to flee the country because the, the government is after his head. He has gone in and out of the prison cells for so many times. But you know, in the midst of persecution, the church has no time to fall asleep. You have to be continually on the run. Do you know that when you have to run, you have no time to sleep? So persecution is not a bad thing after all. We need to really pray hard for our country here in Malaysia. In Indonesia, not all parts, but especially in the big countries, many of the churches, the same thing. We have fallen asleep. We have only treated Great Commission as a slogan. And do you... Can you imagine the absurdity of it all? Imagine if one day I come back home and I see my daughter's room all messy and I tell her, Joanna, go and clean your room. I don't want to see the same mess when I come back tonight. And then when I, when I come back at night, I see that she hasn't done anything to the room and I ask her to come. Joanna, come here. What did I tell you earlier? Oh, daddy, I have memorized your commandment very well. You said, Joanna, go clean the room. I can even say that in Greek. I can say that in Hebrew. Can you imagine how absurd that would be? But yet, that is exactly what we have done to the Great Commission. You see, before a person leaves the earth, their last, their last dying wish, wouldn't you pay enough careful attention to that? Because it's going to be the most important thing that a person says, right? And this is the last words that Jesus said before he went up to heaven. He said, go and make disciples. Baptize them in the name of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit and teach them to obey my commandments. But how many of us only know that as a slogan? Our church preach about it, but we do not know a practical way to do it. And I was frustrated with, with that for many, many years because I've heard about all this discipleship thing, but... There isn't really a practical manner that teaches us how to do it. When Christians meet, we gossip about each other. We talk about things that do not really matter. We talk about temporal things, not eternal things. And uh, there isn't a hunger such as Brother Yin in our life. We are distracted by so many things. We live in a modern digital era where we are constantly bombarded by information. And we carry our distraction around. 
Instead, instead of hugging our Bible when we sleep, we carry this thing in our sleep. Isn't it an irony? I think it's time for chicks from Malaysia to wake up and to really draw near to God and to really come down on our knees and to beg God for revival to happen to us. But guess what? Revival is not going to happen to Malaysia unless it starts with us. Start with a man in the mirror. Jesus said, abide in Christ yeah, and you will bear much fruit. And he says that my Father will be glorified if you bear much fruit. God wants us to bear much fruits. So fruits talk about two things. As I mentioned earlier, the first thing is it talks about the fruit of a spirit. Galatians 5, 22 yeah, and 23. You can read that later on. But fruits is also talking about what we are doing for the kingdom of God. It is the lives that you have impacted for the kingdom of God. And then I understood why I was feeling restless inside for many years. Why I felt as if there is this potential, there is this seed of greatness within so many Christians that have not been utilized to the full. You see, the Bible says that a seed will remain a seed unless it fell to the ground, dies to itself, and becomes a tree. And that is exactly happening. what will happen if you allow the seed of greatness that God has already placed in you to remain a seed. Do you know that every one or single one of us has a gift, has a talent from God, and He doesn't want us to hide it? He wants us to work it out and use it for the purpose of building His kingdom. Yeah? Because a seed, when it falls down to the ground and allows all the surrounding atmosphere, uh, environment, all the pressure from the soil to force it to die to itself, and then germinates to form roots. That tree, uh, that, that same seed can grow up to become a very big tree that can bear a lot of fruits. And in each fruit, there is, a, there is multiple seeds inside of it that can start the whole process all over again. That is how multiplication happens. That is great commission. And when the body of Christ stop being selfish, stop looking at each other, you know, suspiciously, you are from this denomination, I'm from this church, I belong to this particular teaching, I'm, I, I subscribe to this doctrine and that doctrine. When we stop looking at each other like that, when we have this kingdom mindset that we are all one body in Christ, then multiplication will happen. And that brings me to the third point. Bearing fruits means we are doing the Father's will. Doing what pleases God's heart. How many souls will be in heaven because of you? How many souls will not be in heaven because of your life? You see, the way we live in this short time here on earth will impact how we are going to live for eternity. Eternity is a very, very long time. But yet, so many of us, all that we care about is this small amount of time here on earth. We don't think much about eternity. But when I understood this principle, I started to intentionally look for people to go and make disciples. I do not want it to be a slogan anymore. The more I read the word, the more I was convicted that it's not enough to go to seminars after seminars, to hear sermons after sermons and preaching after preachings. Hey, we have become too spiritually obese. We need to, we need to exercise our spiritual gifts in order not to stay so fat spiritually. So I partnered up with this pastor. He's a Chinese-Indonesian pastor. He came with me last uh, few weeks. I started to partner up with him, and we started to intentionally look for people that we can disciple. And it went very well. We started to do one after another, one after another. And then one day, after a ministry, uh, I was in this ministry called Evangelism Explosion, by the way. And I was training at this street, uh, school called Sri Sampuna. I was, teaching, I was teaching the high school students how to share their faith uh, through a discipleship program, one-on-one. -on -one. And uh, after our ministry there, he told me that he got an appointment. We went for Tetari. And he told me that at 5 o'clock, he, he had a meeting with somebody that he had not met before. So what happened was, he was at a restaurant eating food, and uh, somebody saw him praying before that. 
And this lady who was working at the restaurant just approached him and asked him, are you a pastor? I think I saw you praying. And he said, yes. Oh, can I introduce somebody to you? Because he's very interested to become a Christian. Or he said, yeah. So this is the guy that was supposed to meet him. And then uh, on that day, I wasn't supposed to meet, meet up with this guy because we didn't know what he wants, right? We just, all that we know is that, oh, this person wants to know more about how to become a Christian. And what happened was the original schedule of meeting at 5 o'clock was brought forward because he gave a call to my friend, Pastor Jusup, and said, can we meet at 4 instead? I'm at the vicinity already. So we met up and I was there and uh, we talked and uh, he told us that he also was an Indonesian Chinese from Kalimantan and he was working as a chef over here and he has wanted to become a Christian for a long time but then he has to work on Sunday and he cannot go to church and nobody leads him to Christ and I was like hey you come to the right place right so I shared the gospel with him he accepted the Lord on that day in the in the restaurant itself and Pastor Joseph prayed for him to receive the Holy Spirit and what's even more amazing is before we left he asked us I heard that Christians need to be baptized what about water baptism and then I suddenly remembered about a passage where Philip was evangelizing to these Ethiopians you remember that passage yes and then they passed through a pool of water and the Ethiopian said what is stopping me from getting baptized and they did it straight away. Philip didn't say, oh, you have to, sorry, you cannot go through baptism straight away. You have to go through 10, month, uh, 10 weeks course on water baptism. Then I'm going to baptize you and I'm going to give you a certificate. He didn't say that. He said, let's go and baptize you. So I remembered that passage. And I said, what's stopping you from being baptized today? And I asked him, where do you live? Where do you stay? Right? He told me his house is actually not far from here. If you know the the Sun, Banda Sunway roundabout, the BSP, he was working at the restaurant next door and he was staying there. So I said, okay, I'm going to drive you back, get your clothes, go back to my apartment. There's a swimming pool there. <laughs> Me and Pastor Joseph, we are going to baptize you today. Hallelujah. So on the same day, we shared the gospel with him. He was saved. He, uh, we prayed for him to receive the Holy Spirit and he was baptized all in the same day. And I got so excited. Yeah, give all the glory to God. And then something occurred to me. Hey, this should be the lifestyle for every Christian. I felt so fulfilled in my life that day. I understood, hey, this is what it means to bear fruits. When you really abide in Christ, when your relationship with God is right, God will send you people. If you read the book of Acts, it is not those people giving out flyers. Hey, come to the church, come to the church. It is the Lord who added to their numbers, to their community, the numbers of believers. Amen. Amen? So when your relationship is right with God, when you have the heart to reach out, when you want to make disciples intentionally, the Lord will suddenly bring a lot of people unto you. That you don't have enough hands and feet to, to do it by yourself. That is why we have to do it together as a body. I truly believe there is a seed of greatness within each and every one of us. And God wants to use you to truly make disciples of all nations. And not only to say it as a slogan. So out of that frustration, one day the Holy Spirit gave me an inspiration. Hey, the seven habits is so popular right now. And even after the, the founder died, it's still going on like virally all over, over, all over the world. And then I thought about it. Hey, a lot of these principles are actually very biblical. What if we put a Christian context over it and we teach people about discipleship? And then one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, in five minutes, the seven principles just came to me. I quickly wrote them down. Habit one to three deals with how we can become a disciple ourselves. Habit four to six deals with how we can go and make disciples of others or how we can become a disciple maker. And habit seven is how we can stay balanced in our Christian life, our relationship with God. How, we, how, how can we maintain that balance between ministry, activity, and your contemplation, your time being with God? And all these ideas, this framework just came up to me, and I came up with a course to teach Christians how to not only just 
say the Great Commission as a slogan, but to really live it out practically as a way of life, as a lifestyle. And praise the Lord, last month, I launched the program for the first time. We did a retreat on it. Yeah, and just last week, I, I did a part two of it. And uh, yesterday, I heard uh, there were some people who wanted to come for last week's uh, part two, but they couldn't make it. So they, they were eager to join. So I held another seminar yesterday, and Pastor, uh, Brother Stewart was there with us. And many of them, their eyes were open for the first time. They said, hey, this is what we needed to do as a, as a church. It is not about where, which church you are from. It's not about which denomination or doctrine that you subscribe to. It is about the kingdom. It's about the kingdom mindset. It is about us joining our hands, hand in hand, contending for the same purpose in the name of Christ, to go out there and to win the lost souls. And it's about us discipling each other and to grow each other, encourage each other to grow up in the faith. Amen. And I, I think I'm going to call it the Yamcha discipleship. Yamcha. Because it's not about who is standing up on the pulpit. It's not about who the speaker is. It's not about the celebrity speaker as we, are, as we have grown so accustomed to. It is about any ordinary believer going out there, three people, four people, we partner up. We just chit chat, and instead of talking about food, durian, and all the other temporal things, we talk about the Word of God. We talk about how we can grow together in the faith. We talk about how we can go and reach out to even more people. Let me tell you, brothers and sisters, that kind of life is exciting. That kind of life is the way of life that we should have as a Christian. Amen. Amen? Amen. Let's not make Great Commission only a slogan. Let's really live it out as a lifestyle. After the first part yesterday, many of them was very fired up. They told me, when are we going to do the second part? Because we only had time. It was a 9 to 5 workshop. We only had time to do three habits, which is dealing with how you can become a disciple. We talk about how you can change your mindset from looking at yourself as a victim and how you can look at what the Word of God says about you. In other words, have a victor's man mentality. Yeah? Based on Romans 12, 2. Be transformed by the renewal of your mind. Start with that and then we talk about your life purpose. What has God placed you here on earth specifically to do? And then habit number three, we talk about how we can prioritize our life, how we can set a schedule so that we put in the eternal things first in our life. Then after that, then we talk about from habit four onwards, how we can love each other as the right motive. Because one day we're going to stand before judgment seat of Christ where we have to give accountability for the way we have lived our life and our motive in doing everything that we do matters very much. You're going to suffer loss or you're going to get rewards based on how you have loved each other. That's the only criteria. Habit number five, we're going to talk about giving. I learned that the Bible talks so much about the principles of giving and how you can use the seeds, talking about the resources that God has given you, your time, your money, your talent, how you can invest it in the kingdom of God for eternal returns. I like to use this analogy, the monopoly analogy. When you're playing the monopoly game, the money that you are holding on to seems to be so precious. But the moment you stop playing the game, everything goes back to the box. And right now in this life, it is just like a big monopoly game. We hold on to our possessions, we hold, we hold on to our money so tightly because it's so precious for us while we are playing the game. But the moment we check out, the moment we leave the earth, everything goes back to the box. This time, the size is a little bit different. It's two by three, only enough to fit one person inside. But if in the game of Monopoly, somebody comes up to you and say, can I exchange the real money with your Monopoly money? Will it be foolish for us not to do that? Of course it will be foolish. Because the game is going to be over, but the real money you get to keep. But yet, the Lord has already said so many times, Treasure, I mean, gather your riches and your treasures in heaven where there is moth and rust cannot destroy. There is no thief that can, that can steal it. 
but yet we are not willing to let go of our monopoly money. We hold on to it so tightly, thinking that we are going to play this game forever. So that is habit five, knowing how to invest our resources for eternal returns. In habit number six, this is the gist of it. This is the combination of habit number one to number five. I'm going to teach about how we can move together as one body, synergistically, how we can work together as a team, each other contributing according to the gift that God has already placed inside of you. How we can work together as a team to go out there and truly, through Yamcha discipleship, win the nation for the Lord Jesus. And then habit number seven, I'm going to talk about fruitfulness. How you can be fruitful by maintaining your relationship with God, by staying spiritually sharp. So that's all seven habits all about. But I would like to close with this, that our life, the way we live our life, truly matters for eternity. So stop wasting our time doing things that does not matter for eternity. Let us live and make the most of our time and be a wise investor, trading what we cannot keep to gain what we cannot lose. Amen? Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. God bless you.